Hi, you're listening to Copy Time, a podcast series on markets and economies from DVS Group Research. I'm Pem Rubek, Chief Economist. Welcome to our 63rd episode. This is a very special episode for me. See, I was a graduate student in the late 1990s, and in 1998, I happened to get a summer internship at the Washington, D.C. headquarters of the International Monetary Fund. I was highly interested in the drivers and implications of financial crisis, and as luck would have it, I was placed under the supervision of a young Brazilian economist with whom I would develop such good chemistry that we went on to co-author three publications over the next few years, which no doubt contributed immensely to my PhD completion and subsequent employment at the IMF. That Brazilian economist, Ilan Golfayan, soon thereafter left Washington DC to go back to his country, where over the last two decades, he has done just about everything across the public and private sector. Ilan Golfayan is presently chairman of the board Credit Suisse Brazil, but it was recently announced that at the beginning of next year, he would join the IMF's Western Hemisphere Department as the head. Uh, Ilan was governor of the Central Bank of Brazil from 2016 to March 2019 and deputy governor from 2000 to 2003. In 2018, he was named Central Banker of the Year by the Banker Magazine. Previously in his career, Ilan was partner, chief economist and advisor to the board of Itaú Unibanco, also, he was founding partner of Chiano Investimentos and partner of Gavia Investimentos. Ilan Golfayan, a very warm welcome to Kobe Time. Yeah, thank you, Taimur. It's, um, it's walking into a memory lane, remembering on the 90s, uh, well, he wrote all these papers. You know, uh, until today, they are quite cited. Indeed. The papers we wrote. They still, uh, I got all these. Uh, citation indexes and our paper is one of the uh, the most cited because it's about contagion and then it's about uh, we would, you you mentioned 98 and it was just after the Asian crisis and it's uh, it was it was the moment where I was sitting in the Asian department writing papers and it was very nice that you you arrived and then the rest is history for both of us so I'm very happy to be here Actually, I'm I'm basically recording this. I'm I'm not giving any interview, any podcast, uh, but I'm doing this because just because of this, uh, our relationship from the from the past. I'm I'm very grateful for that, Ilan. I really appreciate it. And as you were recalling, I'm also recalling that another paper that we worked on, where we looked at the impact of one country's contagion and reaction in another, and you had that innovative approach of looking at data from resident flow and non-resident flows to sort of you know, parse you know, which part of the investor reacts first and what sort of inside information they have over the economy. Uh, I thought that was very innovative and I'm glad that you know, I got to work with you on that. I've seen many, many papers subsequently uh, approaching that, but 20 years ago, it was you know, very cutting edge. Ilan, again, a real pleasure and I'm very grateful that you're with us. I want to start with talking about, of course, what else, the global pandemic. Uh, yes. What's your view on the fourth quarter and beyond for the global economy as vaccination admittedly is spreading unevenly, but spreading nonetheless? And we're even seeing some news about antiviral pills getting introduced. Well, hopefully we are at the beginning of the end uh, of this COVID. It will not end immediately. It, I think it will take some time, but vaccinations are there. Booster shots are coming in some countries. The asymmetry on vaccination is still there, but slowly and steadily we are getting into developing economies, uh, more and more percentage of people vaccinated, fully vaccinated. Uh, uh, my country, Brazil, we started in, in the left foot, but now you have 50% uh, fully vaccinated and more and uh, almost full of almost 90% more than 90% with the first shot uh, on, uh, on uh, because there is a difference uh, with AstraZeneca, they are giving three months. So between the first and the second, you have a period of time. But at the end of the day, I'm, I, I'm starting to believe that we are at the beginning of the end of this COVID. Uh, markets, of course, uh, are already ahead of the curve. They have boomed. Uh, economies, uh, advanced economies have recovered. Uh, so the US recovered from the fall of last year. 
uh, Europe, uh, even even emerging markets are just basically. Uh, you may not want to call it a V-shaped recovery, but everybody just fell a lot in 2020 and recovered in 2021. So your question, the fourth part is basically, what's going to happen after the V-shaped recovery? Uh, are we going to continue to recover, or are we going to head, uh, hit some some wall on that on uh, immediately? I I think most of the countries will hit uh, the potential, which uh, will mean either higher inflation and, and, and will mean that you will have to abort a strong recovery. Others have space because we are seeing quite a bit of monetary and fiscal stimulus. So whoever has space will just use the space. Uh, the rest that do not have space in terms of potential will just hit some limits. Uh, and that's basically what I expect for 2020. We can talk about the limits on advanced economies, which will basically give the, the overall global scenario its shape. Um, Ilan, uh, you began by talking about Brazil. So maybe we just talk a little bit about Latin America. Um, sitting here in Asia, you know, we don't follow Latin America very closely. But we do know that there are Latin American economies which are very long the commodity cycle and we're seeing some strength yes. in commodity prices. And you mentioned the progress with vaccination. So what's your overall sense of LATAM as we head into 2022? Well, LATAM was hardly hit by the COVID. Uh, it, uh, it affected uh, uh, quite a bit uh, the population, the mood, even the political and institutional arrangements were shook. I can give you several examples. Uh, social unrest in Chile before the COVID, but now we have a constitutional amendment that will be, will be voted uh, uh, next year, which could change a lot of the important rules. And uh, in Chile, you have with unrest in Colombia, uh, more difficult time in Colombia. You also have uh, in Peru, we had a polarized election, uh, a more uh, a candidate that was uh, elected with uh, now challenges to deliver what he promised. Uh, so I will say that uh, Latin America has emerged from the COVID with a lot of challenges, social challenges first political challenges, but also economic challenges. For example, debt, that has increased. So there are some smaller economies with very large debt uh, that had to use whatever they could to uh, maintain their economies functioning. And now they have to deal with their large debts. What, what are they gonna do? Uh, so uh, advanced economies are basically still stimulating their economies, but some of the emerging market economy, developing economies, especially in Latin America, do not have space to stimulate, space, fiscal space, I mean, to stimulate. Before I mentioned space in terms of potential output, uh, but I don't think this is the limit. In Latin America, still a lot of unemployment. We, there's still capacity to absorb but the limit here is fiscal limits. And this is where I believe uh, the challenge will, will be economically. So political challenges, institutional challenges, social challenges, and they come from some economic difficulties we are gonna face ahead. Uh, indeed, Ilan, I mean, as you absolutely, you know, correctly point out that we not only have the issue whether the health crisis morphs into a financial crisis or an economic crisis as the cost of dealing with the health crisis comes due in the coming years. But also it seems like you know, social and political fabric have also been stretched substantially by the stress of the pandemic, obviously. And, and many countries are you know, sort of convulsing from that. So yeah, I think uh, that you know, your, your future institution, a multilateral one and your former institution, bilateral government ones, all will have their work cut out in the coming years. Uh, now, of course, one thing that can trip up um, Latin America, Asia, EM in general, as we have seen in the past repeatedly, is a rise in U.S. Treasury yield. From 94 onward, we have seen this 
game play out a number of times. Um, so if we see you know, slight increase in US 10-year yield and as through the course of next year, the US Federal Reserve carries out taper, market starts pricing an interest rate hike late next year or early next, the following year. Um, so you've already said about the debt, but beyond that, you know, what is your sense of the shock absorption capacity of the global markets? I think we, I, I think the situation is uh, a, a bit vulnerable in the sense that uh, if you have debts, if you have uh, prices, markets are uh, have uh, uh, increased quite a bit. Prices are uh, I, I, the valuations are not uh, are not cheap. Uh, so. If you have a period of uh, more contraction is monetary policy coming from global markets, you all, you tend to have a correction in prices in stock markets in general, in the bond markets because top sold the higher interest rate, the market interest rates going up. <clears throat> but also in the currency markets, strong dollar means uh, depreciation across the board. So if you are in a world with higher inflation and you get the precision of the currencies against the dollar, you tend to have more pressure on inflation. And that means more pressure on interest rates. And that, that means that the challenge to re continuous recovery, which was your question at the beginning will be more difficult. So a big, definition of the scenario for next year will be whether we have higher interest rates globally. And that's, I will say, define 90% of what we're going to see next year. The other 10% are idiosyncratic. Each country, how much vulnerable they are, what can they do, what is the policies and the rest. But the, 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 the immediate impact is uh, U.S. Treasury yields and other global interest rates. Ilan, I'm again thinking back, I think 20 years ago, you had a paper on the pass through from depreciation to inflation. And as you were saying that, I yes. was thinking of that paper. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about inflation because there is such a heated debate in the West in particular about the temporary and permanent nature of the ongoing rise in global inflation. And even within temporary, you know, how temporary the chip shortages will they last three to six months? If they last for nine months, would producers start passing on those prices or will their margins come under pressure? So all those discussion is also going on. So I want to hear a little bit about what your thinking is on this in this regard. Well, I think global inflation has uh, uh, has several uh, several factors, uh, several causes. Uh, some of them you could say temporary, others not. So uh, the recovery from COVID was not planned. As the COVID was not planned, you have all these uh, lockdowns and uh, social distancing, all of this affecting uh, the supply chains somehow. Some sectors, recovered immediately, they actually, some actually boom during the COVID because they were more demanded. Others have not recovered yet. Some part of the services, tourism, uh, airlines, things like that is still to, still uh, way to go in the, in the recovery. But uh, when you look at the same product, when you have different change and you know that in order to produce today globally, you have things produced all over all over the world. And sometimes you have interruptions in a in part of the chain. And for some reason, the workers were not able to produce at the same level that the other parts of the chain produce. And that generated some scarcity. And as you know, scarcity and supply sh uh, shortages mean high inflation. So, that is part of uh, what I call the temporary part, which is uh, COVID-related asymmetric recovery. They tend to have these uh, temporary supply disruptions. And that we're seeing all over uh, all of the global economy. Uh, 
But there is part of what we've seen that is uh, not only these uh, supply effects, temporary supply effect, part of it is basically growth, recovery. And when we see in the US very, uh, you see a lot of vacancies, but not enough uh, job, uh, jobs to fill these vacancies. And it's a generalized phenomenon that is leading to higher wages. One cannot ignore that that's a basic mechanism where demand-driven inflation generates its inflation. More demand than supply, labor market is tight, wages go up. At the beginning, the markup goes down, but at some point, this implies higher inflation. Another sign that there is some heated global economy is that commodities boomed, as you mentioned. I mean, you see all the, it's back and forth. Every time you have a crisis or problem in China, or there is a flight to quality and commodities go down. But the trend, when you look at oil and you look at metallics and those commodities over the last, two years after the COVID, you started recovering COVID is going up. So that gives me a sign that uh, uh, this part of the inflation may not be so, uh, so temporary. So if you combine uh, temporary effects plus the more permanent effect, you get a high inflation. And I, I believe that's the reason we are having inflation everywhere. On top of that, uh, as you mentioned, there is the exchange rates. And exchange rates sometimes reflect uh, idiosyncratic uh, issues. So if you have a country that has political problems or economic debt issues, or you got capital outflows, and that means a depreciation. Once you get a depreciation, there is a pass-through effect. So in, and if you are in a recovery, and that's part of the paper you mentioned, thank you. If you're in a recovery, the past is higher than when you're not in the recovery. So uh, given the precession depends uh, to have a higher or lower pass through, depending on some factors. One of them is if you're in a recovery or not. The second is if, the, if your currency is already undervalued. And some countries are undervalued, then if you get an additional uh, depreciation coming from whatever reason, that means high inflation. So, Global inflation plus idiosyncratic inflation, which is sovereign inflation, they're all giving uh, more or less uh, inflation uh, in our emerging markets, developing in advanced economies. From the perspective of a central bank, should supply side inflation be ignored? No, I don't think that it should be ignored but it should be treated differently from a demand uh, side inflation. On a demand side inflation, things are much easier because the demand side inflation means that you having inflation and you have to go back to the, your target or you have to, uh, if you don't have a uh, inflation target but you have just a target or you just care about inflation, you have to react because inflation is up. If you have a demand side inflation, you're reacting when you are uh, above uh, full, uh, full employment. So you are overheating, you are below the natural rate of unemployment, whatever is your definition of that, you are heating. So demand side inflation, you get high inflation when the economy is strong. So you react and you decelerate the economy and you, and, you, and you rain on inflation at the same time. And you don't get a recession, you just get a deceleration with lower inflation. That's easier to deal. The problem with the supply is that the correlation is, is, the, is the opposite. Whenever you have high inflation, come the supply shock. It's also the case where you're not in full employment. You tend to have either, it's a supply shock that generates, typically an oil shock generates 
a recession, or it's just a, a temporary supply chain that do not allow you to, to produce, so you are shorted, shortage of uh, production. So whenever the central bank reacts uh, to avoid deflation, it makes recession worse or makes the deceleration worse. And that's not, uh, uh, not the ideal moment to do it. However, central banks still have to react. So they, I will say that the uh, accepted uh, protocol, if you can say that, is that you react to the secondary effect of inflation. Mm. You allow prices to go up price level, so you don't, re you don't want the oil shock to go down, you don't want the, uh, the relative prices to move back, you don't want a recession, but you don't want this one-time impulse to just feed into inflation. So if you allow wages to get in, to, to absorb this past inflation and put them to the future, to prices, and then you get services which have nothing to do, for example, with the initial start to start having increases. So you react to the secondary effect of this shock. So demand inflation, you just react normally. Supply, you react to the secondary effect, but you absorb the first round effect. Well put, Ivan, uh, that makes sense. Um, so temporary, permanent demand supply side, whatever the cause is, the Federal Reserve is of course looking at this with an innovation. A couple of years ago, it came up with this uh, average inflation targeting framework. And there is this view that it could be by design increasing the risk of policy error because it's more of a rear view mirror policy. It's not as preemptive as the earlier uh, reaction function was and it could then start getting into policy credibility. Of course, you know, we don't see evidence of that in the market-based indicators, but that seems to be one fear around average inflation targeting framework. What's your view on that? Well, my view is that uh, for quite some time, even decades, uh, advanced economies, and I will say globally inflation has been subdued, but uh, it has been below target for some advanced economies. And that means that they had to react some way to get back to target. And one of the devices was to affect expectations and to say that even if inflation goes up, they will not react immediately. And the way to commit for that was the average inflation target to say, well, even if inflation goes up, it will take the, I will look at the average. I will not look at the, at the, at the, at the, at the, at the margin. So that is somehow a way to commit yourself to having low nominal rates, which if inflation goes up, means lower real rates. And that's a way to stimulate the economy when you are at a very low inflation below your target. So by design, you say you're not going to react to the margin. The problem is when you get to the margin and inflation is up and you have already committed to not react to stimulate the economy. So what we see today is basically the commitment that you promised you had to deliver because if you don't deliver, you won't be able next time to promise and people believe. So now you're getting the inflation you're committed to lower interest rate, real interest rates, and you're delivering that. Of course, that's good in the way up because you allow the economy to some more degrees of freedom. But as you mentioned, once you get inflation and you want inflation to go down, then you're in the opposite side, which means that you will accept uh, higher inflation even though you need to be preemptive and you need to somehow reduce inflation. So you basically, in the way down you are with average inflation, you're, you're using part of your, what you mentioned, the rear mirror, you were looking at past inflations and you have to see what, what happens. So it is, it is a 
traditional classic trade-off between commitment and flexibility. And we are now basically paying the prices of commitment or past commitments. And we could be, uh, how we could have a scenario, I was gonna say lucky, but I'll take the luck out of it, but you could have a scenario where inflation is temporary and the costs are very small on falling on average and you've done well and over, not overreacting, or you could have a more permanent inflation where the consequences will be much dearer because you will be seen as behind the curve and, and trying to raise interest when inflation is already embedded in prices. So I will say next year will be crucial to start to define whether we, have, we are having a temporary inflation and being more, uh, I will say, slow and moving average is good or permanent inflation where you'll have to run uh, behind what you lost. Right. I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, if one is going to go formally toward average inflation targeting, one should probably actually say very clearly, you know, over which period, which is still sort of ambiguous as far as the Fed is concerned, they might as well say it's a price level target in my view. Um, so Ilan, um, related to this, uh, staying with the Fed, but this is also applicable to Bank of Japan and ECB, and to some extent, some emerging markets as well, that, you know, a lot of money printing since the GFC, and until very recently, you know, there was no, you know, manifestation of major inflation. And we also now have, parallel to this, this new line of thinking that, you know, if the government wants to spend into productive areas, they should just issue debt. Central bank should help them in terms of the financing if it needs even monetization, so be it. Uh, but, uh, but it's okay because it will raise long-term growth rate, it will address social inequities, and therefore we should not spend too much time worrying about debt levels and so on. Um, it seems like a bit of a you know, call for a paradigm shift from what you and I studied in school or practiced in our professional careers. Uh, what's your view on this? My view is that uh, we are still, uh, we have not still abolished the limits. Uh, it could be that the limits uh, in the last few decades were far away from what we, we expected because of the global nature of what we have seen uh, an incorporation of large chunks of population into the global economy that may have pushed prices to go down, not to go down, but inflation to, to go down. Uh, and it may have given the impression that the inflation will never come, that it will never happen. So then you started with uh, uh, theories that will tell you that it's forever. Uh, that uh, whatever you print or the world, whatever your debt limits, there are no limits, you can continue doing it. And it's always a very, uh, I will say a very enticing proposition because if you don't have debt limits, you can just spend whatever you want because just issue debt. And if you don't have limits to spending, it's wonderful for politicians because they don't want to they don't need to care about budget constraints, they just spend. And uh, what is the problem with another bridge? What is the problem with another support? What is the problem with another, um, another pr program, either infrastructure or not, or just writing checks? There's no limit, so why do you care? And if there's a limit for debt, you just print it, and if the printing is free, just do it. And of course, there's enough people like me that have a very suspicions of this uh, non-limit uh, theories that we just say, look, it's it just not, it's not going to work forever. It's good that we don't try to reach this limit. Uh, maybe we have already reached the limit because inflation seems to be back, and we're discussing whether it's permanent or temporary, uh, maybe it's permanent and, they, and, they, and then the party's over. Maybe it's temporary and we still have more to go on this, uh, uh, trying to reach the limits, but 
what I, I would say is that what if you look at history, it tells us that it takes long, but eventually you reach the limits. And then you say, why, why, why we why we didn't stop the excesses? Why we have not stopped before? Let's regulate better. Let's do a, a different, uh, ask for more capital, ask for more regulation. Let's prohibit doing stuff. But in the way up, we just keep entertaining theories that basically say no excesses, they don't exist. Just go for it. And then we face the crisis and then we blame everybody. But at the end of the day, we should blame the non-limit theories. It has been quite difficult because of the COVID and the seriousness of the crisis to still argue that whatever, that whatever you do, you support your economy, you support the poor, you have consciousness of the need to governments to act, but at the same time know that there are limits of what you can do in terms of budgets and monetary policy too. I, final question, Ilan, I mean, have, or well, two more questions. One question first is that have economists as professionals done a poor job of sort of figuring out what the limit is? Because I remember a decade ago, there was a whole Reinhardt Rogoff paper and they looked at, you know, hundreds of years of, you know, debt crises and they had certain thresholds, um, which many developed countries have pushed through in, in recent years. And, and therefore, you know, you have the proponents of, you know, free lunch who will say that, look, they went past the Reinhard Rogoff threshold and nothing has happened. So why should developing countries uh, do anything differently? So firstly, I mean, do you think that, you know, there are ways to sort of establish such limits or is it really, you know, country by country idiosyncratic? No, I think that just that it could be the case that for some specific reason, we, we just face the, and there's inflationary decades. Let's assume, just for reasoning, that you have a 2000, 2010, 2020, 20 years of abnormal low inflation. I just give you one reason for that with a large incorporation of, of big chunks of the population to the global market. That for me is a very reasonable explanation for low inflation for two or three decades. Let's assume that that happened in two or three decades. But we as an economist, we don't have the data to say that this is just one larger cycle and not just a permanent change. So we are, the, we are here, we look at the past data. It gives us an information. Inflation doesn't come in one year. It doesn't come in five years. It doesn't come in 10 years. And then we are going to conclude that it will never come. But maybe our sp sp span of time, a generation is 20, 30 years looks like eternity. But maybe for the economy, it's not an eternity, just 20 years. But we as a generation, economies, memories, papers, we just say it's, it's forever because it's, it's our life, it's our span of life. But when people will look at it from, from the past, they will say, well, there was these two 20 years of low inflation. The guys believe that these 20 years is forever and then they screwed up. Okay. Then they had to, inflation went up, so it just will have to go up. You had some crisis and then they, Again, learn the least lesson that that limits. Very well put, Ilan. I, I love the way you sort of, uh, you know, frame that. It gives me some, you know, food for thought as well. All right, finally, it's been almost a little more than two, 20 years since you left Washington DC and went back to Brazil. You've done all sorts of things in this last 20 years. And now starting in January, 2022, you'll be heading the Western Hemisphere Department of the IMF. What's your personal reflection on that? Well, it's so nice to be able to have a full cycle. We started like uh, young economies trying to figure out uh, how the world behaves, how emerging markets behave. We wrote those papers, but we also wanted to know what will happen with our careers. We were just at the beginning. 
Now we have spent, we, 20 years later, oh, we are 20, 25 years later, actually, we are, we are back, uh, I am back to try to go back to public policy. I always like the fact that uh, we can have experience in, in the private sector, learn how markets work, learn how, how people react to different incentive policies, how people read uh, public policy, policymakers' way of communicating, and then be able to go back to uh, public sector and continue to try to help what we studied, we, we both did PhDs, we learned, uh, and I always thought that there was part of us that could give us back to society, part that they invested in us. In addition that uh, I think public policy is fun. It's fun to see, and to try to figure out how to, how to help uh, the economies. Well, Ilan, I wish you the very best of luck. I know that you have a few months between you. your current job and the next job, so rest well, enjoy the end of the year, and I look forward to seeing you in Washington one of these days. Yes, I uh, unfortunately I will not rest because I, I still have to do the transition here in my current job and have uh, do all the, all the changes, transition, hiring, everything, but I hope to get to the IMF with full energy uh, to work and hopefully we'll keep in touch. Let's do that. And if Absolutely. you're in Washington, please come by. Uh, you can count on that, Ilan. Uh, thank you again very, very much. And thanks to our listeners as well. Kopi Time was produced by Martin Tucky. Daisy Sharma and Violet Lee provided additional assistance. It is for information only and does not represent any trade recommendations. All 63 episodes of Kopi Time are available on YouTube and on all major podcast platforms, uh, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. As for our research publications, webinars, and live streams, you can find them all by Googling DBS Research Library. Have a great day.